Welcome back to part 3, Murder of the Black Donnellys. If you missed part 1, the early years, and part 2, the stage line years, I recommend that you watch those before continuing with this story. My name is Angie, and I will be your host on this episode of Mean Streets Canada. This episode focuses on the Donnelly family of the Gulf Township, known as the Black Donnellys, and the terrifying night of February 3rd in the early hours of February 4th, 1880. We will quickly get started, but before we do, please subscribe to the channel and we will begin. We pick up the story where we left off. Tensions were high and violence was at a peak. In 1878, Constable Samuel Everett claimed someone fired a shot at him. He accused Robert Donnelly, and Robert was sentenced to two years in Kingston Penitentiary. The following year, 1879, Constable Everett is convicted of assaulting William Hodgins, another constable. Everett then confesses that he is not certain that it was Robert Donnelly who had shot at him. This does nothing for Robert, however, as he serves the remaining time of his sentence. Little did the Donnelly family know that 1879 would continue to get worse, with Father John Connolly of St. Patrick's Catholic Church in Bedolph. Father Connolly began to hear the stories of the troublesome Donnelly family. Before ever meeting them, he had formed his opinion, and it was of detest and prejudice. Soon Father Connolly, man of the cloth, was reported to be preaching hatred against the Protestants, a long tradition brought from Ireland. When James Donnelly Sr. had had enough, he stood up in the church and denounced the priest for his hatred, and said his family from that time forward go to the Catholic Church in London, and they did. The Donnellys had been persecuted for many years by the very people they attended church with and many of their own neighbors. They were a hard-working Catholic family that had Protestant friends, many of whom would attend their funeral. Due to this mistreatment, William Donnelly writes to Father Connolly, complaining that he is unfair to the Donnelly family. As far as it is known, Father Connolly did not reply, but he did respond. In June, Father Connolly conceptualizes and founds the Peace Society of the Dolph. The Peace Society's role was to uphold its code. The code was established by the church, well, mainly Father Conley, and a handful of patrons. Included in the code was a request for people in the community to pledge their support and to agree to have their homes searched for stolen property. The Donnellys did not sign the pledge. The so-called code was something the Donnellys were never shy about ignoring. With little respect for the church's leader, in fact, James Donnelly, was progressive for his time, liberal, one might say, that at one point he even donated money to assist in the building of the Anglican Church. Of course, this outraged the Bedolph Peace Society and the St. Patrick's Church, as the belief of that the Catholic money should solely go to the Catholic community. Unsure, as to whether the Donnelly's generosity triggered the change, but the Peace Society soon changed their name and became known as the Vigilance Society. James Carroll is part of this group, as are many of the Donnelly's neighbors. Not long after the creation of the Vigilance Society, a cow disappeared from the Thompsons' farm. The Vigilance Society included James Carroll, as many of the group members decided, they began to search the Donnelly's farm for the cow. The cow was later found at home. The Donnelly's insisted that they be charged trespassing and no charges were laid. The year continues with James Carroll becoming a constable. He promises to rid the township of the Donnelly's. Carroll goes to William Donnelly's home to arrest Thomas on an old charge but Thomas is at his parents' homestead. William goes to warn Thomas, and John helps Thomas escape. The Vigilance Society and Carol search for Thomas. John is charged with aiding Thomas's escape and is later charged with perjury, but he is acquitted. 
With common hate for the Donnellys not progressing quickly enough, Carol and the Vigilance Society initiate a hate campaign against the family. In turn, some neighbors become too scared to be seen with the Donnellys, further becoming outcasts of their community. The heartbreak continues when Michael Donnelly, now living in St. Thomas and working for the railway, goes to Waterford for work. While there, he decides to go out on the town and is stabbed to death during a bar fight with William Lewis. Lewis is convicted of manslaughter and sent to the Kingston Penitentiary. Only five of the seven brothers remain. If the Donnellys had not been through enough, 1880 would prove to be the worst year ever. The year started off with a positive note when Robert Donnelly returns from serving his sentence for allegedly shooting at Constable Everett, which we now know had been made up. Soon after this, the nightmare begins again. On January 15th, Patrick Ryder's barn burns down. That night, Thomas, John, and William Donnelly are all at a wedding, so the Vigilance Society blames James Sr. and Johanna Donnelly for the fire. The elderly couple had no stake in the Ryder's barn and claimed themselves innocent. There have been many arguments over the reason for the murder of the Donnellys. However, the burning of the Ryder's barn is considered to be the final straw against them. After these allegations were investigated, the community was informed that there was no supporting evidence linking the Donnellys to the burning of the barn. The community was outraged. They had had enough of the Donnellys and decided to take law into their own hands. This news quickly reached the congregation of St. Patrick's Church, and the priest, Father O'Connolly, quickly addressed it as the evil that had befallen the community and that there would be a reward of $500 for the detection of the evil persons, and he vowed that the guilty party would be punished for their sins. There are many considerations as to what was the right form of punishment. Some believe fines and jail time would have been deemed acceptable. However, others believe that there was nothing short of, ex short of execution would calm the issues that had arose from this family. The day of February 3rd began with James Sr. angry and frustrated. Having believed his family had endured enough, he asked his son Tom to write a letter for him. James Sr. pens a letter to the lawyer in London, Alderman Edmund Meredith, the London lawyer that was going to be handling the Donnelly case against Patrick Ryder. James Sr. complains that his family unfairly blamed for everything persecuted, shunned, and demonized by their neighbors. He writes, Mr. Meredith, Sir, on the 15th of last month, Patrick Ryder's barn was burned. All the vigilance committee pointed the finger at my family. Ryder found out that my boys were at a wedding that night. He at once arrested me on suspicion and also sent a constable to my wife in St. Thomas. Mr. Donnelly Sr. continues writing the letter, explaining to Mr. Meredith the situation and asking for him to handle the case on their behalf. His explanation is that he doesn't know how they find it possible that a man and a woman over 60 years of age would drag themselves around in the middle of the night, lighting fire to people's barn. Honestly, I don't understand it either. He signs the letter, yours truly, James Donnelly Sr. Tom leaves to deliver the letter and returns shortly. Once the letter has been delivered, the day carried on as normal. At roughly four o'clock, Johnny O'Connor, James, and Jim return to the house on the Roman line. The time frame was given by William Casey because he stated that he remembers the sound of the Donnelly speeding down the Roman line and that they were being very reckless. Casey stopped what he was doing in the front yard to bear witness to the recklessness that was occurring, as well it was then where he noticed the time that they had passed his home. They picked up Johnny O'Connor, a boy and friend of the family, from town because James O'Donnell needed assistance on the farm. 
and Johnny had helped on the farm many times before. When the chores were completed, it was Mr. Donnelly that insisted that Johnny stay the night and to sleep in Mr. Donnelly's bed as a form of protection as well as the bed was extremely big and they needed Johnny to assist with chores in the morning. Unknown to the Donnellys, the Vigilance Society was beginning to hold meetings at the Cedar Swamp Schoolhouse. They asked James Freehaley to spy on the Donnellys later that night and James agreed. That night the Donnellys prepared for bed as they needed to attend the trial of the burning of the Ryder Barn to be held in Granton the next day. John Donnelly leaves the family farm and goes to William Donnelly's home on Whalen Corners to borrow a sleigh to take the family to court in the next day. He decides to spend the night at William's house along with a friend, Martin Hogan Sr. Back at the Donnelly homestead, Thomas, Joanna, and James Sr. Donnelly, Johnny O'Connor, and James's niece, Bridget from Ireland, prepare for sleep. James Sr. and Johnny O'Connor retire to the bedroom at the front of the house. Randomly, a neighbor stops by just to say hi. James Freehealy was returning home from the Whalen line and did not stay long. In fact, as we know now, he had just come to observe the property for the Vigilance Society. However, he had mistaken John Donnelly's voice, heard coming from Mr. Donnelly's bedroom, which was actually Johnny O'Connor's voice. Once goodbyes were said, the family returned to their beds and fell asleep. Thomas retires to the bedroom off the back kitchen. Bridget and Johanna sleep together in the next room, and James Sr. at the front of the house. Just before midnight, February 3rd, 1880, the Vigilance Society gathers at the Cedar Swamp Schoolhouse. The original plan was to visit the Donnelly's home on the night of February 3rd handcuff the Donnelly men and escort them from the home where they would be hanged from a tree by their necks until they confessed to their crimes against the community. However, one of the problems with their plan is that no one really understood how this was going to be properly executed. In fact, it appeared they had chosen just to wing it and see how it goes. This allowed for the plan to change and be challenged when they finally arrived on the Donnelly property. In the beginning, the original plan of intent was to only hurt the Donnellys and bring them to a disillusion point. There were some more problems associated with this plan, such as the society did not plan for John Donnelly leaving the home and taking a horse to Big Jim Keefe's. The society wrongly believed Keefe was spying for them. He was not. And finally, they did not plan for Johnny O'Connor to be in the house during the attack leaving behind a most reliable witness. As the clock enters February 4th, 1880, John and William Donnelly and Martin Hogan go to bed at William's place. Nora Donnelly is already asleep. John and Hogan share one room and William and Nora another. All of the Donnellys are in bed at this point, unaware of what is about to happen. In the meantime, a mob of 30 plus people had gathered at the schoolhouse. Once the men had had enough alcohol in their system, referred to as the water of life, they began discussing their plan. Using the liquor as a way to numb their senses, enhance their courage, and increase their motivation, they began to walk the Roman line. A little after 1 a.m., February 4, 1880, the Vigilant Society, whose, whose members included Big Jack Kennedy, William Freehealy, Pat Dewan, the Heenan brothers, Dennis, Anthony, and Michael, John Lampanier, James Harrigan, the Riders, Mr. Ryder, Jim, Patrick Jr., Thomas and Daniel, and the McLaughlins, Martin and John, Ted Tuey, John Kane, John Mayer, the Quigleys, Ned and Johnny, William Thompson, John Dorsey, John Byrne, Michael Madigan, James Kenny, and James Carroll all proceed to the Donnelly homestead. Armed with firearms, pitchforks, axes, shovels, and various other clubs and tools, they made their way down the line. There were many witnesses that stated that they could hear the group of drunken men coming down the Roman line that night. When the group of men finally arrives at the house, they surrounded the perimeter of the property, 
Once the decision was made to attack the Donnellys, James Carroll took the first step inside the house, which was considered to be the first attack of the massacre, creating an element of surprise. Carroll allegedly enters the home, first via the back kitchen door, slowly took handcuffs out of his pocket given to him by Constable Hodgins, and handcuffs Tom Donnelly while he's asleep. Once Tom Donnelly was handcuffed, Carol did proclaim he was under arrest, and at that moment Tom sat up in bed as well as Mrs. Donnelly and Bridget Donnelly due to the commotion. Bridget and Johanna awake, start a fire, unsure of what is going on. The commotion woke up Mr. Donnelly, and he noticed that his son was handcuffed and proclaimed, What have you got against us now? Carol responded that they were being charged with another crime. At that moment, Tom requested that Carol read the warrant. Since there was no warrant involved, Johnny, unseen, passes James Sr. his coat and slowly makes his way to the hidden corner. Carol slowly moves from Tom's bed to Mr. Donnelly's room when he noticed that, when he noticed that John Donnelly was nowhere to be found. Their plan was to kill all the Donnellys in a single location. Already, things were starting to fall apart. It was then that Carol let out a signal for the men to come storming into the house with their clubs. As many as 18 men entered the house. They began to beat Mr. Donnelly, Ms. Donnelly, and Tom Donnelly. Bridget Donnelly was able to escape and race up the stairs in order to hide from her attackers. Johnny was so terrified that he hid underneath Mr. Donnelly's bed. Since the men were not expecting him there that night, they did not know to look for him. In turn, saving his life. The first one to fall to the ground was Mr. Donnelly. He was beaten rapidly, and James Mare hit his skull repeatedly causing brain damage. Mrs. Donnelly, on the other hand, fought hard against her attackers. However, she was eventually beaten to the ground by Carol. Tom Donnelly was fighting extremely hard to protect his family, as well as himself. He broke free from the attack and ran towards the front door. As he was running, Tom Ryder was waiting for him with a pitchfork and thrust the sharp points into Tom multiple times. Once Tom was limp on the ground, James Mayer, Timothy Tui, and Patrick Quigley carried his body back into the house and placed it in the kitchen, where his as Carol removed his handcuffs from his wrist, someone yelled, hit the fellow in the head with the shovel and break his head open. It was said that either Jim Tui or Patrick Quigley bashed in Tom's head three or four times. Once Mr. Donnelly, Mrs. Donnelly, and Tom Donnelly were all lying on the ground, the men realized that Bridget Donnelly was nowhere to be found. A group of men went upstairs and found Bridget hiding, and they began to beat her to the point where they were able to bring her limp body down the stairs with the rest of the family. To add to the terror and to the amount of blood shed in the single household, one of the men also bashed in the dog's head with a shovel because it would not stop barking. It was not long before the group realized they were missing John Donnelly. They decided to create another plan for that night to rid the community of the Donnellys completely. The mob spreads coal oil and sets fire to the cabin, with all the bodies still inside, and went hunting for John. By 1.30, Johnny O'Connor flees out the back door and goes to the home of Patrick Whalen. Originally, the massacre was not intended to have any witnesses. However, the Vigilant Society did not intend for Johnny O'Connor to be at the Donnelly farmhouse and for him to escape the fire. The O'Connors were considered to be good friends of the Donnellys and assisted them regularly with chores around their farm. The mob did not take this into consideration when planning their attack. When Johnny arrives at the Whalen farm, he tells them about the murders and the fires, and after some time they go back to the Donnelly cabin, which was in flames. The fire raged on with the bodies inside. It had snowed for most of the night, and the snow began to cover the scene of the murders in the morning, once the fire had subsided. About 2 a.m., after killing Bridget, Thomas, Johanna, and James Sr. Donnelly, the Vigilant Society travels to William Donnelly's house at Whalen Corners. They surround the house in a similar way they did with the Donnelly's house, 
However, the difference was the men were not as relaxed as they were when they began. They decided to try and get Will Donnelly to come out of the house, instead of storming into the house as they had done. They began to beat his prized stallion in order to lure him out of the house, as the screams from his dying horse would surely alert him. The problem was that the stables were far from the house, and no one inside could hear the screams from the horse. The mob separates and surrounds the house. Members of the mob start shouting fire, hoping that their cries will wake William Donnelly. Jim Ryder calls for Will while carrying a shotgun to the side door of the house. Instead, John Donnelly wakes up and goes to the door. He is mistaken for William and is shot, allegedly by Martin McLaughlin and James Ryder. John, greeted by gunshots to the chest and groin, 30 holes were placed in his chest that pierced his lung, broke his collarbone, and several ribs. John dropped to the ground. McLaughlin and Ryder walked up to the body and placed seven more shots into John as a form of punishment for his actions against the community. Nora Donnelly, Will Donnelly's wife, heard the commotion as well and saw John's body on the ground. She tried to pull his body to safety, but it was too heavy to move. Will Donnelly hid in the bedroom and was able to peer through the window in order to get a glimpse of the individuals who were attacking his family and his house. John Kennedy and Carol. John Kennedy and Carol were only a few feet away from the bed where Will was hiding with his wife. As he peered out from his hiding place, he could also place the faces of Big Mike Keenan, William Carroll, and Patrick Ryder. The other faces were blurred by darkness. Since Nora could not pull John to safety, Hogan got down on his knees and snuck out to where John was located and pulled him into the bedroom, which had left a bloody trail behind him. John Donnelly died within five minutes. The men of the Vigilance Society were so worn out from their previous attacks that they decided to survey the perimeter until someone showed their face inside. The members of the household hid in the house for almost three hours before the group decided to leave the property. It was the words of Jim Frihili that ended the night of murder with the phrase, There's been enough bloodshed tonight, boys. Let's go home. Fortunately, this ended the night, as the plan was to continue to Big Jim Keefe's house. As the sun rose above the Donnelly farm, neighbors come to view the burned Donnelly home and the remains of the murdered victims. Like animals, some scavenged for souvenirs. The police arrived and put the remains of the bodies into one casket. Will Donnelly survived and was listed as an informant on the death certificate of all five of his family members, and it was dated April 1st and 2nd, 1880 with the cause of death listed as supposed to be murder. The battles with the Donnellys had come to an end at the hands of the Vigilance Society, a mob that was built by neighbors and so-called God-fearing people. Evidence indicates that the Badolf Peace Society, or some of its individual members, may have been responsible for a lot of the arson, property damage, and physical violence cases within Badolf all of which were blamed on the Donnellys, including the actions against their own family. In the end, no one was convicted for the murders of the Donnelly family. Even though there were many eyewitnesses, the community had band together and stayed tight-lipped, and they all walked away, truly believing that they had rid the evil from their community, never seeing that the most evil resided within them. I do plan on covering the trials in the future, so let me know down below in the comments if this is something you're interested in. The tombstone had been erected at St. Patrick's Church Cemetery. The family was once again disrespected as vandalism caused them to remove the stone without the family's consent. A new stone was erected in its at the family's expense. Information about the family and the events surrounding their death was suppressed locally for much of the 20th century, due to many of the residents possibly having ancestors who were involved. In 1995, the Lucan and Area Heritage Society formed to document and preserve the local history, and the organization opened the Lucan Area Heritage and Donnelly Museum in 2009. If you would like to learn more, I encourage you to visit the museum take a drive down the Roman line. 
This concludes this episode. Please check back soon for another bloody good video as we travel the mean streets of Canada. In the meantime, be kind to each other. Be kind to yourself. Also, if you'd like, please subscribe. I'd appreciate it. Thanks.